So this is going to be the lecture for the wall sections, which is um, for the week of March 30th through the um, April, let's see here, April 3rd. Um, so you're going to want to watch this video and then you're going to be creating a wall section based off of the project for the Josephine project. But I'm going to be showing you today how to determine the wall section height with accuracy. Um, so that your wall section can then um, inform your wall heights for your elevations and your, uh, your drawings. So um, here's the basics. So on this first page here, let me hit uh, present so it looks a little bit better. We have two examples of um, different types of framing systems that are typically used for uh, typical methods of construction in this area. So one is balloon framing. And what's happening with balloon framing is um, the wall studs themselves are going all the way up through to the to the highest level. So this is a, a representing a gable end wall and usually there that's where the construction would stop and then the gable end wall would be framed and then put up there. Um, but the balloon uh, framing is considered to be balloon framing when it goes beyond one story. Um, so uh, what has to happen with balloon framing is because we're creating these openings, basically these chases, they're called, between the studs, um, which uh, need to be blocked for updrafts and also for fire stop or fire blocking. So there's these little pieces of wood in between each stud to create a barrier between the two floors. And then the floor itself is... Um, hung, if you will, on each stud by being attached to each stud. The floor joist is attached to the stud. Um, and so it is pulling the studs in and also creating that floor system. Pretty much everything else is framed the same way, the spacing of the studs, for instance, and then how we frame the corners and so on. Now, this is an older method of sheathing that's being shown here, too, where there's a diagonal strapping being placed on the outside. Um, with balloon framing, there does need to be some cross bracing. Um, and a cross bracing looks a lot like this. They're showing cross bracing on this as well. Um, and the reason for that is because of the length of the studs and how far that they're spanning, basically. Um, they need to be cross braced to uh, prevent from racking. Platform framing is definitely a lot more common now because one of the other problems with using balloon framing is that we need to get... Um, a tree that's tall enough to cut the length of the stud for a two-story structure. Um, with platform framing, you can begin and end your construction at every platform, which makes it really convenient to work with. So um, the studs are um, sized and framed to fit the wall height of the first floor, and then a whole new platform is placed on top of that, and then another layer of walls is placed, and then so on. Um, there's the advantage of the balloon framing is I can put up an exterior wall very quickly, um, but I do need equipment or multiple people to be able to handle such a cumbersome wall height. Um, so there is an advantage with, um, I guess, the speed at which you can put up a balloon framing. And you still see balloon framing for especially half-height walls on the second floor. But with platform framing, um, it's easy to frame a wall system with maybe a couple of crew members and then um, using some bracing and some um, um, some ingenuity basically on site, two people could uh, um, raise these uh, walls and, and get them framed fairly quickly. And then um, we can also cover that pretty quickly as well and, and get, get yourselves out of the elements. So um, this platform framing system tends to be used a lot more often now. Um, so let's look at the what the book has to say. So I've got a link here to to the book and it starts, I've got it on page, um, uh, the, the chapter we're in is, is wall sections, but I uh, went to the, specifically to the section on wood wall sections. Um, the chapter is quite lengthy, but it covers all types of different wall types, um, CMU block, brick, um, metal stud and so on. And so I've started uh, the chapter where uh, the page starts on wood construction, which is 5.41. And it shows you another illustration, which is pretty good on um, uh, balloon framing and how it's done. 
And then a cross section here to see how that uh, blocking between the floors is, is placed in between the studs to prevent that um, either draft and uplifting and also fire stop. Here's our illustration of our platform framing um, and uh, showing the methods of uh, sheathing that you can use and that there would more uh, most definitely need to be cross bracing of some kind. Um, and it's showing you just how the layers, if you will, of the stories are being placed one on top of the other, which is why it's called platform framing. If we go a little bit lower here, this is an important piece. This is, um, I have it, um, whoops, zoomed in on and illustrated in this view here. Um, there's a difference between platform framing and it versus uh, balloon framing here and some of the pros and cons of each one. And so I've zoomed in a lot closer to that particular section of the um, the, the book that I, I just showed you to, to be able to see um, what are our limitations with building with wood construction. So if I'm using 2.4 studs, um, according to the book, about 14 feet tall is the maximum height we can make a ceiling height, for instance. Um, your spacing should be 16 inches on setter, except when supporting only a ceiling or roof, then we can push those um, studs 24 inches on center, but we really shouldn't make them much more than 10 feet tall. So this is a scenario we might use actually for a garage, because a garage, especially if it's uninsulated and um, um, just supporting a roof, we could use two by fours. And as long as we make the garage walls not more than 10 feet tall, and that's just counting the wood construction portion of the walls. If our slab is dropped below the top of the foundation wall, then we could have a slightly taller uh, ceiling height, but the wood construction shouldn't be much more than 10 feet. And then I can space those two by fours, 24 inches on center, no problem. The two by six studs um, uh, have the ability to, to uh, be a maximum height of about 20 feet. Uh, 24 inches on center is recommended. And then it says here, except when supporting two stories in a roof. Now, I don't entirely agree with this because there's a, th a thing called advanced framing that requires that you, um, when you're framing your studs in your, in your floor joists, that you frame them in such a way that your studs and floor joists um, align with each other perfectly so they're centered on each other and therefore continue the um, um, line of uh, structure from the first floor all the way up to your uh, uh, ceiling on your second floor. Um, and by doing that and being careful about where you place your framing and placing your studs directly below your floor joists and aligning them, you can use 24 inches on center. The advantage of this, of course, is that it gives us a lot more space to add insulation and improve the efficiency of the house. So this is sort of true if we're being haphazard about where we place our studs, but if we're very careful about placing our studs in our floor joists at exactly the same alignment, then we can get away with 24 inches on center spacing quite nicely. All right, so framing terms. This is what um, a, a wall in, fr in a framed wall looks like if it's um, exposed and doesn't have any sheathing or gypsum wallboard on it, we can see the bones of the wall, if you will. And these uh, studs that show up at full length are called common studs. And then the stud that's adjacent to the um, opening is called a king stud because the king stud is providing support to the jack stud. The jack stud jacks up the header and it's being attached or nailed to the king stud and then the header is then given a little shelf of one and a half inches on either side for it to be supported and hold up this weight that we're um, removing studs from this, this area so we can walk through this wall. Well, we've got to figure out how we're gonna carry that load of those floor joists that are going to frame on top of those. And so these headers are designed to carry the weight of the floor and whatever else is on top of it based on what the scenario is. And then we have our top plate here two top plates are typically used and one shoe plate. Notice the shoe plate is removed when we're in a door opening. Um, the threshold usually goes there or it's just floor framing. But in um, this uh, case of a window opening, we have a sill, it's called a sub sill. There could be two or one 
um, two by six below that. I'm showing two here, but um, with advanced framing, so so that we can get a lot more insulation in the walls, you might see just a single two by six here, so we can get a little bit more insulation in in there. Every place we have wood means those are areas we cannot put um, the insulation, and the wood is a, a pretty good conductor of cold. So, so there's some thermal bridging that can happen um, everywhere a stud is. So we're trying to reduce the amount of studs in the wall so we can get as much insulation in there as possible. So in the case of a window opening, then we have a jack stud still, and it's really designed exactly the same way as the door opening, except that we put a sill in here in order to create the base for where the window unit is gonna rest. And then um, below that, we have to put in um, a cripple anywhere the spacing would require that that cripple be located. So if this window width was a lot opening, I might need more than one cripple that's being shown here. Um, and so those are the basics. Um, common stud, king stud, jack stud, and cripple header top plate, shoe plate. Those are the most common um, terms you need to know. All right, so let's look into how do we determine the wall height? How do we figure out what is the minimum height our wall needs to be for our design that we're working on? And so what I need you to be able to do when you're looking at a floor plan is um, identify, uh, first of all, what's the tallest opening that I have on my first floor. So let's start with the first floor. And it's usually going to be the door. Um, your opening or your door has got to be at least six feet eight inches in height um, and with a rough opening of uh, six feet ten and a half because we usually add two and a half inches to both the width and the height to get a, um, um, a rough estimate of our of our rough opening. And a rough opening is the um, framed opening that we have here, the rough opening from the inside face of the jack stud to the inside face of the jack stud, from the bottom of the header to the uh, subfloor, that's called the rough opening. And it allows us enough room to put the window or door unit in and then have a little bit of space around on all four sides for shimming and uh, making sure that the door or the window go in straight and plumb. So um, once you determine what that door size is, and these are the two most common door sizes we see in residential construction. Um, and so the height of the door changes depending, I think, on the, the price <laughs> and the uh, size of the house. So you might see a seven foot tall door on a grander house and more like a six eight on a house that's more uh, typical, typical construction. But the other things that we can have on a door are side lights, which are these here, or transoms, which is a little bit more window or um, fenestration basically designed around the door unit. So if that's the case, what we would do is take um, our door width, let's pretend this is the three foot wide door here, we would add the one foot side light that we have on both sides, making that a five foot wide door, and then we'd have add two and a half inches to that. So this door here, um, width wise, would be five feet, two and a half inches rough opening. If I were to add a transom above it as well, and the transom height is one foot, then that would be um, six feet, eight inches plus one foot would make it seven feet, eight inches, plus two and a half inches would make the rough opening seven feet, 10 and a half inches. And that's how you come up with your rough opening if you've got something a little bit more than just a main door. So um, for the most part, we're gonna use these two as an example um, in the, the coming examples that I show you in the preview or the, these uh, slides. So let's pretend we're looking at a floor plan. And this is our floor plan and uh, we also uh, want to be able to determine the widest opening. So I've got here a series of openings, all the openings that we have in the drawing. And you look at both the doors and the windows in this case. And according to this, it's saying that um, all of the windows except unless the ones that are called out specifically are four feet, three inches. So that means all these windows and that window are four feet, three inches and it's a casement. So the width of the window is four feet. These are also four feet. 
this door back here is five feet wide, so that's wider than all those. So I mean, this, that means that eliminates all these windows. I'm not worried about those. But then this trumps that door because this is six feet wide. And uh, that also beats this one. And then, boom, we have the winner, which is seven foot wide bay. That's the widest opening. So we take that widest opening. Um, and the reason we take that widest opening is it's the worst case scenario. The header that has to be sized over that opening needs to be the biggest size header because it's carrying the most weight above it. And so it needs to be sized appropriately to be, carry, be able to carry that, that uh, span, if you will. So and if I design a header to fit over this window, then that same size header is certainly going to use for the, uh, be able to be used for the rest of them. But more importantly, this is going to tell me how, how uh, tall the, wind, the uh, uh, wall will need to be designed in order to fit that header and this door height in, in the same wall system. So the last bit that we need is what is the header supporting? And this is our elevation of the same project. You can see that if the header is going in here, it's going in above that bay window. And it's just going to be supporting this roof. So I only need to be concerned about that header supporting a roof. All right, and then we put it all together. And this um, is uh, located on page uh, um, uh, 5.45, rather, in your book. So if we go back to our, um, our book reference, that chapter or that um, table is located here for header supporting. Now this is a rough estimate though, and I, I, I don't mind using this at the beginning to get the concepts, but after this, we're gonna use the span charts for girders and headers um, that will be coming up here in a little bit uh, that I wanna make sure you're using. But that's, the, um, that's where that uh, table comes from. So according to this, uh, my widest opening is seven feet. So I, I'm looking at six foot uh, to eight feet or eight feet to 10 feet. And I'm only supporting a roof only. So I'm gonna go with the larger of the two headers. I tend to do that if it's between the two, I go with the larger one. And so I want two two by tens next to each other. Um, so the height of that two by 10, the actual height is nine and a quarter. So I would add up all of these things. I'd add up the rough opening of the door, six feet, 10 and a half inches, because that's my tallest opening. And then I'm gonna put on top of that, what's the tallest header I need? Nine feet, uh, nine and a quarter inches. And then I also need to have the two top plates at the top, three inches. So the total wall height that I have to have as, as a minimum is seven feet, 10 and three quarters. Now, if we go back to the um, previous elevation here, previous slide, the reason why we're using the tallest door is notice that the windows are being hung at the same height as the door. And that's why we're using the door height as our header height for the, uh, all of the openings on the first floor. So that's, what, that's why that's uh, six feet, 10 and a half inches. So seven feet, 10 and three quarters is the shortest we can make the wall. Um, but that, that, that's all that that means. Now, what does that mean when we translate that into our floor, uh, our full wall section? Well, before we do that, we all also want to know what our floor plate height is so we can build a, a full wall section from the top of the top, top of concrete to the top of the uh, first floor wall. So we're going to go back and review what we need to know again for floor framing. And I am interested in knowing what's the size of my floor framing plus what's am I using for plywood sheathing plus my mud sill thickness? Those are the three things that are gonna give me my floor plate thickness. If I'm using Revit, however, I do need to add in the three quarters of an inch finished floor because Revit um, measures all of the other um, vertical height dimensions from the datum of zero feet, zero inches at finished first floor. So I've gotta go from finished floor rather than from subfloor. So this is our example plan here. We've got 32 feet in one direction and 40 feet in the other. So uh, my spans here between my lally columns and my foundation wall are 16 feet equally on both sides. And I, if we go into our span chart, we can find that two two by 12s at 16 inches on center have a max span of 16 feet, three inches with a 40 live load and a 20 dead load. And that, that sounds good to me. So that tells me that, um, informs me rather that my floor joists are 11 and a quarter plus three quarters of an inch thick 
uh, plywood plus one and a half inch mud sill gives me 13 and a half inches for my floor plate. So there's our full wall section, including the um, uh, theoretical section between the bay window. So if we were cutting right through that bay window, this is what it would have to look like. And so our wall height is seven feet, 10 and three quarters from our subfloor to our top plate. This gives us enough room for two two, two by sixes for the top plate, the two two by tens for the header. And then this is our rough opening for our bay window of five feet. And then we have a sill height of um, one foot, 10 and a half inches. And then we have our height from our subfloor to our top of concrete is 13 and a half. And it all adds up. It all adds up to our original calculations. So we see how we have to do a lot of this stuff on paper first. And then we can, it, it informs us of how we're going to build that section. All right, so this just means that we can make the wall height no less than seven feet, 10 and three quarters. If we wanted to make the ceiling height taller, then some of the approaches you can do are logical approaches to how construction um, uh, materials are cut. So studs are cut at two foot increments, eight feet being um, the most common. So if we don't wanna have to cut any studs, I could take eight foot studs plus the one and a half foot shoe plate plus the two top plates, and I end up with eight feet, four and a half inches. So making a wall height of eight feet, four and a half inches seems arbitrary, but it really makes a lot of sense when you count up the thickness of the shoe, the two double top plates, and then now our studs from the top of the shoe to the bottom of the top plate is exactly eight feet, and I don't have to cut them. And that, re that reduces my labor costs. Another idea is we can go up a two feet because remember studs come in two foot increments and so I can do the same thing and make my wall height 10 feet, four and a half inches, or I can decide on a specific height. I just can't make it any shorter than the seven feet, 10 and three quarters. So here's an example. I've made the wall height eight feet, four and a half inches. And so what I have to do now is incorporate some cr cripples above the header here. And the cripple height will always end up being whatever I've used for a wall height minus the minimum wall height will be the cripple height. Um, uh, that's if we maintain the same head and sill heights that we started with, then that cripple height will be that. If I decide to move this sill height and move the head of the window up or down, then it won't be aligned with the doors anymore, but um, that can change that number. But the, if we keep that header at exactly the same place it was before, six feet, 10 and a half, then that number should match this minus this. And there's our Revit numbers over here that still add up because I'm just going from the finished floor now to the top of concrete, adding three quarters of an inch to the 13 and a half, making it 14 and a quarter inches if we use the same floor framing. All right, so this is a sketch of um, what you need to know. And if you're sketching your uh, wall section, it should look something like this. And these numbers that I have here should come from um, the total wall height should be the wall height. Um, it, it has to be greater than or equal to the minimum wall height that you came up with on your worksheet. Your header size for the tallest opening should uh, be the rough opening of your, um, usually your door. I want you to be able to call out what this is. Um, these are your, this is where your header would go. And you can see we put insulation in between it. And those header sizes would generally be two by four, two by six, two by eight, two by 10 or two by 12. And we can have two headers or three sometimes if we've got a really wide opening. The rough opening of your window or door um, could uh, usually is gonna be determined by the manufacturer, but I'm just using simple numbers, numbers here. So that head height minus the rough opening of the window, for instance, gives us our sill height. Um, these would be cripples here, but we might want to call out the um, stud size and spacing. So two by six is at 24 inches on center with R22 insulation, for instance, would be an example. And then that's our shoe plate, two by six. We've got a three quarters of an inch. T and G stands for tongue and groove sheathing. And then we've got two by um, whatever size floor joists we need. Um, this is a bar scale. This bar scale right now uh, is set up so that uh, if I were to change the scale of this drawing, the bar scale is gonna change with it. 
me go back to that and hit escape and show you what I mean. If I resize this, the bar scale is going to resize too. So it's always going to remain in scale. And I could use that bar scale to measure things um, on this drawing because I've included it. So when you do your wall section, if you're doing it by hand, please include a bar scale that indicates what the scale is that you use to draw out the, the, uh, the wall section. All right, so the next um, picture we have here is what does that look like if we're looking at it from um, the framing elevation? So framing elevation is just like this. Elevation because we're looking at the side of the wall, but we're seeing the framing exposed. And we're able to see the stud location and where the cripples fall. And I know this seems like, well, why aren't, why aren't these two cripples laid out evenly between these two spaces? Because we start framing at 16 inches on center from the end of the wall, and we keep going at 16 inches on center, regardless of where those openings are. Because the openings don't always fall in exactly the perfect places. So that's why these studs seem like they're not placed evenly because we're starting from here and we're going every 16 inches on center to locate a stud. Here we have a big opening, so we start again over here. And the reason for that is so I can put up my sheathing and I can mark where those 16 inch on center spacing is and screw the sheathing um, to the face of the wall and know where that where those studs are supposed to be. Here, because this opening is much wider, we have two jack studs instead of a single jack stud. Um, and this is showing an example of cripples above the two headers. Um, and then here, this is considered sol solid blocking or box header. And then we have the sections of those two to see the example of what those look like. So this is the cripples with the two uh, headers above the opening. This is what a box sill or excuse me, box header would look like. So it would be boxed out and then insulated on the inside. And these are the um, dimensions here. This is the dimension for the studs. So the studs would have to be cut to seven feet, eight and a quarter inches if the wall height is eight feet, three quarters of an inch. Eight feet, three quarters of an inch seems arbitrary, but if we add up three inches, uh, three inches plus one and a half plus our six foot ten and a half inches sorry let me start that over if we add up our six foot ten and a half inches plus our eleven a quarter plus three inches it adds up to exactly eight feet three quarters of an inch when you subtract the three inches plus one and a half inches from that number you get the stud length So here's another example project. Um, this one, we're going to walk right through it. So let's pretend we have a garage. And I've, I'm showing you two elevations of the garage, the front and the back elevation. Um, we're not bothering with the sides, because the front and the back are actually the two sides that are having to support header, uh, header support, because they're supporting the roof. So you can use your page 5.45, but I'm going to actually use the um, um, the span tables in this example um, because you're going to see the difference between the header size that they re it shows in the book compared to the header size that's required in the span table is pretty different and so I wanted you to see the difference. So the rough opening of the overhead doors is nine feet wide by eight feet tall. The windows are all three feet six and an eighth wide by four feet four and seven eighths tall. And these are rough openings. So these are the sizes that we need to achieve for the framing. And the door rough opening is three feet two and a half inches by six feet ten and a half inches. So what's our tallest opening? It's nine feet is the overhead door. What's our widest opening? It's also the overhead door. It's eight feet wide. The header is supporting the roof only. The building width is 24 feet. So I'm going to use the beam spam chart. Um, there's our 24 foot wide building right there. And if I go down the span, I have to look at a span that's at least nine feet or more. So I could use this one right here. I just used the first one I came to. I obviously could use four two by tens as well if I want to. I decided I wanted to use three two by twelves. So these. Um, not, that means that those openings for those overhead doors could be up to 9 feet 10 inches, but I only need them to be 9 feet. Um, but that's fine. So if I go across from there, it's showing me that I need three 2 by 12s to do that, and I need two jack studs. So what's going to be my minimum wall height? It's going to be 9 feet plus 11 and a quarter plus 3 inches, 
or nine feet two and a quarter inches. If we look at the framing for that um, wall framing elevation of that front of, of the garage, this is what it would look like. So starting from the corner of the garage, we would have um, the uh, face of the um, two by six facing us here. And then this is another two by six that we're seeing on this on the uh, one and a half inch thick side right up against it nailed to it. And then from the edge of where the wall would be to the center of the first common stud would be 16 inches. Um, and then if you could imagine going 16, 16, 16, 16, 16, another one would land here. But we have this huge nine foot opening that we've got to accommodate for. So what we really see here is um, uh, the uh, rough opening of the overhead door ends up being about two feet from the outside edge of the wall to the inside face of the rough, rough opening, then nine feet plus two feet plus nine feet plus two feet adds up to 24. So we've got 18 plus two feet is 20 plus another two feet is 22 plus another two feet is 24. So you can see that that adds up. The rough opening dimensions add up. Inside of that rough opening, we have, uh, to the outside of it rather, we have two jack studs that make up a three inch shelf for those three two by 12 headers to rest on. And then we have the king studs, which go all the way up to the top plate. But those king studs, remember too, are being, uh, are the uh, framing members that these jack studs are relying on being nailed to, to be secured and in place. Um, since this whole door, uh, overhead door system is kind of centered on that elevation, we do end up having an exact center common stud. And then we're basically seeing the same configuration on the other side. Um, and we end with seeing um, the uh, side view of the stud from the narrow side on the end with the front face view of the stud right up next to it. Um, because we want to do the opposite of, that we did on this side in order to frame in the wall that we have um, coming into it at the corner. And if we look at that, one of the things I kind of blew over a little bit is the framing of the actual wall systems and the corners in particular. So let's go back here and show that. So there's our corner configuration. So what you're seeing in those two elevations is that stud, which we're seeing the face of it, and then the end of this stud um, and that's why uh, it looks like that on the end. And these are all configured, these, these are different ways of framing the corner. And these different methods allow you to have nailing points for your sheathing or gypsum wallboard on the inside on two faces. So notice it creates this little corner edge to be able to nail that gypsum wallboard in both directions. All right, and so that you can see too that this is nine feet two and a quarter exactly as, uh, as we uh, calculated. And this is a close up of what's going on with those jack studs and king studs around the, uh, the two openings on either side. This is what it would look like in section. So and I've got something set up here a little bit differently because what I've done is a little bit more realistic is the slab would be dropped down a, a specific amount from the top of concrete wall. So the measurement is from the top of slab to the uh, bottom of the header is nine feet. And then our top of wall height would then be the two by 12s plus the three inch top plate, which making up the nine feet, two and a half, two and a quarter inches from the top of slab not necessarily from the top of the concrete wall. If the slab happened to be perfectly aligned with the top of the concrete wall, then that would be the case. Um, so recognize that your rough opening dimensions and all that are coming from wherever the floor is. And this shows uh, what that might look like in sections. So there's our header, there's our two top plates, and this is showing the door track for the overhead door on the inside of the garage and the section of the door track kind of partially open here. Um, and this is a close-up of what's going on there. So those three two by 12s would be pushed so that they were evenly sp spaced in the wall. We might even put pieces of plywood in between them. Um, and so that's what that would look like. The other side of the wall, because remember when we go back to the beginning, there's the other side of the garage uh, uh, 
the back side of the garage, if you will, is only got a pivot door and a window. And those door, the, the door and the window height are set to the same height, but they're much lower than where the uh, door height is here in the front um, where the overhead doors are. So when we look at that elevation um, of wall framing, we still have to have the same wall height. If we add up seven, in, seven feet, two and a half inches plus five and a half, plus one foot three and a quarter plus three, it does add up to nine feet two and a quarter inches. This space here is taken up with cripples because the only, um, we only need to have two two by sixes over these two openings because they're less than, um, they're less than, uh, they're less than four feet wide, both of them. Um, and so our rough openings, three feet six and an eighth, three feet two and a half, we look at those in our span chart again and go back to our 24 foot wide building. Um, both of our openings are more than two and 11. So we gotta go to the next size up four foot four. They're definitely smaller than that. I only need one jack stud, but I do need two two by six headers. So when we look at that elevation, these are the two two by six headers hung at the same head height. And the height of the cripples is the result of subtracting that information from the total wall height of nine feet, two and a quarter inches. And that's how it would look on that side. Um, so that's pretty much it. So what I need you to do is take this information and you're going to determine your, um, your wall height for the Josephine project. Now, many of you are uh, picking your own windows and doors. So depending on what you use for windows and doors, your answer could be different than someone else's. But you need to remember that you need to know the tallest opening, the widest opening, so you can determine the header size. And then you add up that rough opening, uh, uh, tallest opening, plus the header depth, plus the two top plates. And then you're, you know your minimum wall height that you need to work with for your Josephine project. Um, so the other thing I have for you for uh, additional resources is um, if you, those of you who decide you want to do this in AutoCAD, um, I have two videos that show you how to set up an architectural template that you can watch. I also have an AutoCAD template file that you can start with and download. Um, and it's downloadable. Uh, it has, let me just show you what it looks like. Um, this is actually the file I used to create that um, wall section. But if I go to new and I've downloaded the file onto my computer. So I put it in a folder for myself. It's called wall section DWT. And I've got I've given you a uh, full foundation wall here. So all you have to do is build the wall section from there up or in this one that I used for the garage. And over here you have um, all the different two bys sizes that are blocks. So you can copy the blocks over. And these give you your rough opening sizes for your doors. Um, I just used a six eight door for the two typical doors, the, the typical size of a, a side light and the typical size of a transom. So you can kind of put different config configurations together. You have a little door, door threshold symbol here. And then you have what you can use for uh, wall framing. Um, and so you can kind of use these to build your wall section. So let me give you an example. Let's pretend I have six feet, ten and a half inches. To just offset that. That's my uh, rough opening height. And then I know that I'm going to be using two two by tens. Stack those together. And I know that I will have a shoe plate. I can create my lines for my wall height here to here. And um, I want to offset um, my 2 by 10, 9.25. And then I want to offset 3 inches. And I'll also copy that shoe plate up here. And now I've got my stacked full section of a wall. If it was at the um, 
one of those, uh, if, you know, if it was at a rough opening for a window, I could also put in a sill height. Let's put that at around two feet. So this would be of the beginnings of a cut floor framing, uh, I mean, wall framing system at the window where there's the rough opening for the window right there. Um, and um, it would end up looking like, uh, let's go into the rest of the framing stuff that I have for you here. It would look like, um, and you, you guys all have access to this as well. This is all the shared folders that I gave you. So if you go into um, wall section, I think, well, maybe it's wall framing. Yes, wall framing. You have um, in this folder um, a full wall section that shows what does it look like when I see that wall in section going through a door and it shows the full framing of the door and then what do I see if I see a, a window in full section. By the way on the second floor um, because you usually don't have a door to determine the rough opening height you usually want to go with what's the um, minimum ceiling height you want for the inside finished space and then add two inches to that number. So if I want a ceiling height of seven feet two inches, I'd need my wall height to be seven feet four inches in order to end up with seven feet two inches for a finished floor to finish ceiling height, especially if I'm using strapping and gypsum wallboard. So this gives you an example of um, what a full wall section might look like. It also shows what uh, interior partition wall section might look like um, and then the kinds of call outs that you would see there. So that's a really good reference to use. Um, I also have some additional uh, YouTube um, things that you can take a look at that are on uh, how to create a wall section if you want to really build one from scratch. So let me go to my channel and I'll add these to that last slide as well. If we go into 165, I've included, oh, there we go. Um, pretty sure I added those wall sections. Let me see here. Maybe they are not there yet. Oh, there they are. They're in a separate playlist. So I have a 165 wall sections playlist if you watch these wall section videos in order, part one, part two, part three. It walks you through how to create a full wall section um, in AutoCAD as well. So that's it. Um, uh, I think that'll give you a, a lot to work with. Um, I will be available on Tuesdays and Thursdays from 1.30 to 2.30 for questions. Um, so there you have it.